buddy. Thanks, Javon. How are you guys doing tonight? Great. I'm glad that Javon did not butcher my last name. Uh, a lot of people call it Walkies, Walks. I was just uh, recently traveling through Amsterdam, and it was refreshing. If, uh, if you're from the Nederlands, it's Velkis, which was very refreshing to go through the Netherlands, and everybody knew how to pronounce my last name. It was very refreshing. I have the honor and privilege of leading and directing the, the Bridge Street House Prayer, the B Shop, and yes, some people do call it the BS Hop. Uh, you may if you want. I'm not offended by that. It's funny. <clears throat> Man, I'm honored to be with you guys tonight. CCDA West Michigan 3.0, momentum. You guys excited? How many of you guys first time at a CCDA event? Wow, like most of you guys, that's awesome. How many are charter members of CCDA West Michigan? A couple charter members, awesome, love it. Man, I am honored to be here with so many people that I love and respect and have learned from and peers that we're just on this journey together trying to figure out how to lay hold of the kingdom of God in our neighborhoods. And uh, I love that. We are starting out this conference with a focus on prayer. When Rudy gave me a call and asked if I would speak on this topic of the intersection of prayer and urban ministry, I was thrilled that that's where the focus is going to be, where we're going to start out here. Starting out in worship and then starting out with a focus on prayer. So in that vein, let me start us out with a prayer. Jesus, thank you for uh, tonight, for this opportunity to be with your family, your, your children and your bride. And uh, God, I, I want to represent you well in these few moments. I want to speak well about you and speak well to your church. So Holy Spirit, come and be with us. Speak to us. Pray that the words that I speak would fall on fertile soil and produce much fruit. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Like I said, I love that we're starting out with a focus on prayer. And prayer is uh, it's one of these weird things, especially in a in community development world, in the Christian community development world. It, it's a weird thing because as followers of Jesus, we would all agree that prayer is important, right? There's a prayer, it's an important component of our lives, of our church, of our activities. And yet, is it safe to say that it is the thing that is often the first thing to be forgotten. That often, especially in our West Michigan culture here, where everything's about working hard and planning and strategizing and meetings, and, and then our meetings run so long that we don't even have time to ask God to bless it at the end of the meeting. Right? You guys, you guys know what I'm talking about here. And yet we would all agree that prayer is important. So what is the role of prayer in community development? Well, I want to, in the few moments that we have here, argue with you and plead with you that prayer should have a central place in our efforts, in our neighborhood, and in our ministries, in our organizations. That prayer shouldn't be just compartmentalized or something that we add to the end of our strategizing meetings and asking God to bless it, but prayer should actually be at the center of what we do in Christian community development. See, this is part of my story. Ten years ago, I moved into the west side of Grand Rapids, which is arguably the best place on earth. I, uh, yeah, come on, west side. I regret to tell you that you guys all live in the second best neighborhood in the world. Come to the west side, there's plenty of, there's plenty of room. So myself and, and just a small group of other guys 10 years ago moved in to a neighborhood in the west side of Grand Rapids. And when we moved in to the west side, we didn't, have, we didn't know what we were going to do. All we had was prayer. Now, when I say all that we had was prayer, I don't mean that we moved into the west side and wanted to do Christian community development. What I mean is I didn't even know what Christian community development was. I didn't know what urban ministry was. I, if you would have told me 10 years ago that today I would be speaking at a West Michigan Christian community development 
conference, I, I would say, what's CCDA and why are they having conferences? This was not on our radar anywhere. I, as a matter of fact, I was a, 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 a civil engineer. I was working as a civil engineer, living a very nice life, leading a, a, a young adult ministry at a, a large suburban church here in town, and life was great. And it was about 10 years ago that God called myself and a small group of other men into the west side, and we just began to pray. Again, we didn't know about the neighborhood. We didn't know what God was doing. But we had this sense. We had this keen sense that God had us there for a purpose. And they had a plan for that neighborhood. And so we started out with a very simple prayer. And the prayer was this. God, what are you doing in our neighborhood? And how can we be a part of it? God, what are you doing in our neighborhood and how can we be a part of it? Because again, we, had, we heard that this, already this evening, right? That God is already at work. And we had this sense that we were in the neighborhood to just join with the work that God was already doing. So we just started praying. And we were praying day after day, week after week, month after month. And after a little while, we had this idea. We felt like the Lord was speaking. And we felt like the Lord was saying, start this coffee shop. We thought, wow, that's a great idea. Let's start a coffee shop. We'll start a little business, a little cafe. We'll make some money. We'll employ some people. We'll help finance maybe some ministry. What a great idea. And so we started renting the space, but we just had the sense that God had something else that he was doing in that time. So we continued to pray, and we prayed, God, what are you doing in this coffee shop? And, and we felt like God said the most interesting thing. We felt like God said, it's all supposed to be free. It's all supposed to be free. You're not supposed to charge for coffee here. This is like, this is crazy. How does this, how does this work? And then God started speaking about what this coffee shop was going to be. See, we thought it was going to be a little cafe where Christians could come and hang out and have their lattes and have a little prayer meeting and then go home, right? And God said, no. No, this isn't going to be a Christian hangout. This is going to be a place of safety and refuge for the lost and the broken and the hurting and the marginalized of your neighborhood. We had no idea what that meant at that time. But then we felt like he said, oh, and by the way, don't worry about the coffee. I'll take care of it. I don't want you to ask for it. I don't want you to pay for it. And it will never run out. What do you do with a word like that? Well, we were naive enough to just obey. So we opened up the doors and I, I don't have the time. It's a beautiful story. I wish I had two hours this morning because I could tell you incredible, miraculous stories. Here's what I can tell you is that we've been running the pavilion. We call it the pavilion. And in, in uh, Psalm 27, verse 5, in the King James Version, it says that in the time of trouble, he will hide me in his pavilion. And I'll tell you, eight years later, the pavilion has become a safe place for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. There have been hundreds of people that have found a safe place in a very chaotic, transient, and often difficult neighborhood. There have been many people that have, been, that have experienced and heard about the love of our God and whose lives have been transformed. Oh, and by the way, the coffee that I told you about, we've been serving coffee now for eight years every day. And in eight years, we have never paid for coffee. We have never asked anybody for coffee, and we have never run out of coffee. Come on, you can't make that stuff up. That's awesome. Because here's the deal. God had a bigger plan. God had a greater plan. In Isaiah chapter 55 and 8 and 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. See, we had this little idea that we thought what God was doing, but God had a greater plan. God had a higher vision. And God has a greater vision and a greater plan for your neighborhood. God has a greater vision and a greater plan for your organization. And I want to ask this morning, are we aligned with God's vision and God's plan for our neighborhood? Are we aligning ourselves with God's plan and God's vision for our organizations? See, God has a vision for your neighborhood 
that is greater than anything that you're going to come up with in your strategic plannings. God has a greater vision for your neighborhood than anything you're going to come up with in your brainstorming sessions. God even has a bigger plan for your neighborhood than the collective voice of your neighbors. Whoa. Careful. Careful. Rudy Carrasco. You guys ever see Rudy Carrasco do this? Now, I'm not, I'm not discounting. We do all of those things. What I'm saying is God's got a greater vision. Are you aligned with the vision of God for your neighborhood? And I want to submit to you that prayer is one of the primary ways in which we align ourselves with God's vision for your neighborhood. So we live in this culture where we spend so much time doing and planning and then and then analyzing, and then revising, and then planning, and then doing, and we get so caught up in that, do we take time to listen? To listen to God? Do we, do we even believe that God speaks to us? Do we even believe that there is a God in heaven who is alive that speaks to us, that has a vision and a plan for your life, for your neighborhood, for your family, for your organization, and he wants to communicate that vision to you? Do we even believe that? And do we take the time to listen? Because I think that sometimes we get so caught up in so much good stuff that we forget to listen. Prayer is the place where we align ourselves with God's vision. And I'll tell you, when you align yourself with the vision of God for your neighborhood, that's where transformation takes place. When you live in concert and in partnership with God's vision, that's where transformation takes place. That's where momentum happens. Moment, did, you, did you see what I did with the momentum and the... That was awesome. Come on, I did that just for you. I just thought about that yesterday. I've never said that before, but I knew that Rudy was going to like that. But seriously... When you align yourself and you're living in concert and partnership with God's vision, that's where transformation takes place. Along the journey for us for in the last 10 years, we've gotten to know so many beautiful neighbors and heard so many stories of, of incredible brokenness like many of you have in your lives, that many of you are surrounded with in your ministries, in your neighborhoods. And here's the thing that we've found over 10 years is that the challenges and the plight of our neighbors is so much deeper than circumstance. It's even so much deeper than emotion. It's so much deeper than systemic oppression. There's, there's things at play in our neighborhoods that are so much deeper than what we can see with our eyes. In Ephesians 6 verse 12 it says this, Paul writes, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Friends, you have to understand, there is a battle going on right now for your neighborhood. There is a battle going on right now for the heart of your neighbors. And it is a battle that is waged in the heavenlies. God, I, let me just make this really clear. There are angels, there are real angels and demons. There are real angels and demons right now that are battling for the heart of your neighborhood. And friends, as followers of Jesus, we need to learn how to engage in that battle. We need to be aware of that battle. We need to learn how to stand in that battle. Because there are things that will happen in your neighborhood. There's things that will change when you pray. Because prayer is one of the primary tools and weapons that God has given us to engage in this battle. There are things that will happen when you pray that would not happen if you did not pray. There are things that will change in your neighborhood that will not change if you don't pray. Because there's spiritual forces going on in our neighborhood. There are things that will change in your, when you pray that won't change by your fair housing summits. There are things that will change in prayer that won't, cha that won't, that won't change by your education reforms. 
There are things in your neighborhood that will change when you pray that won't change by your, by, by your, by your tutoring programs. There are things in your neighborhood that will change that would not change if you didn't pray. Think that, there are things that will change when you pray that, wouldn't, that won't change by a free coffee shop. I use all of these examples because these are things that we are actively involved in right now at the Bridge of Prayer. Actively involved in. Vital components. But there's, there's something that happens that when we pray that shifts things in the heavenlies. It unlocks things. Guys, and, and here's the deal. I don't know what I'm talking about right now. I mean, I'm talking about mysteries that I have no clue about. But here's what I know is what the Word of God says. What the word of God says is that the prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective. They accomplish much. That when you pray, things are accomplished. We even see examples uh, with Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, right? Daniel starts to pray and then Gabriel shows up and he says, the moment that you began to pray, I was commissioned to come and give you an answer. And then later in that, we see that Daniel prays again and then, and then uh, Gabriel goes out and he, he's battling, the, is it the prince of Persia? Did I get that right? Guys, I, I understand, I'm not like this super charismatic guy. I just know the word of God and there just seems to me that there's evidence that when we pray, angels and demons move. I don't, I don't know how that works. I'm not like charismatic man here. I just, I just know what the word of God says and we've seen it in our neighborhood. Again, if we had more time, I could tell you story after story uh, where things are happening because we pray. I'll give you one quick example. Uh, it was several years ago. We've been prayer walking our neighborhood for 10 years. We just prayer walk our neighborhood all the time. Still do it today. And uh, we just felt like probably three years ago, we felt like the Lord was saying, I'm, I'm extending your influence into Lincoln Park. Lincoln Park is a park right next to our coffee shop. We just felt like the Lord said, I'm extending your influence into Lincoln Park. A couple of things happened around that time. We found out from local gangs that Lincoln Park and the pavilion had been declared neutral territory by local gangs. And then things, and then uh, if, you, if you followed the news, there's a millage that was just passed a parks millage that's releasing millions of dollars to renovate several parks in Grand Rapids. And Lincoln Park is on the top of that list. And the Bridge Street House of Prayer was selected as the neighborhood liaison to engage neighbors to help design and give voice to this park. Come on. You know, things happen. There's things that happen. There's... There there's things that happen in concert. When we pray, there's things that happen in concert with the heavenlies. There's things that even maybe are broken loose so that your, your efforts here on earth can be effective. Maybe there's things in your ministry, in your neighborhood that you're coming up to, uh, you're coming up on a block and, and you need to pray that thing. To, again, I don't know what I'm talking about right now, but what I know is that I've seen it in my life and I see it in the word of God. Let me wrap up with just a couple of thoughts. We're here at the Christian Community Development Association Conference. Christian Community Development. I want to submit to you that if we are going to engage in Christian, if we're going to put that title on it, Christian, then our efforts should be distinctly Christ-like. That our effort, there should be something distinctly different about our efforts than what other people are doing. And it should have a distinct Christ-like flavor and aroma to it. And I want to submit to you that some of these ancient disciplines like prayer and evangelism, man, I wish I had more time to talk about evangelism in our neighborhoods. These ancient disciplines of fasting and weeping should actually be strategic and integral components of our ministries. Let me ask you, where does intercession fit into your strategic plan for your neighborhood? Does it fit into your neighborhood? Even as I was preparing for this, this is something that's core to us, but I can feel it always, like you get so busy and stuff, right, that this kind of stuff just slips away and I've just been convicted to continue to make this a center point of what we do at the Bridge Street House of Prayer. I want to encourage you friends to make intercession a central and key component of your neighborhood initiatives. 
Let me finish up with this. When we talk about prayer, the point isn't even necessarily a transformed neighborhood. When we're talking about prayer, we're talking about a greater reality. We're talking about something so much greater when we engage in prayer. Because at the heart of prayer is a living God. At the heart of prayer is a risen Christ. A Christ who died for my sins and yours and your neighbors so that they could be free. That at the heart of prayer is engaging with the living Christ so that he could be exalted in our neighborhoods. That's at the very heart of prayer. At the heart of prayer, it's not about me, it's not about you, it's not about our neighborhoods. It's about Jesus being exalted in our midst. Let us not forget that in our efforts in our neighborhood. So let me conclude with a final thought. Maybe, perhaps, the best thing that we could do for our neighborhoods would actually be to take some time to take our eyes off from our neighborhoods and put them on Christ. Or as the writer of Hebrews encourages us, he says, fix your eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Got to read this. It's harder to quote scripture in front of people. Scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Friends, thank you. Rudy, thank you for inviting me. CCDA team, thank you for putting this together. Kelvin College, thank you for hosting us. Friends, thank you for coming tonight, and let's have a great weekend. Bless God. Thank you so much.